This is uh, 47, Lima Tour Beach. <laughs> this goes out to Marin County. <laughs> <laughs> Rory and I head out to the sweeping crescent of Lima Tour Beach at dawn, frost on the windshield, driving over the last remnants of the coastal range, past a herd of albino fallow deer. The Farallon Islands are as crystal clear as jewels in the cold morning, the clearest I have seen them. Fenton the dog chases pelicans, and Roy takes a dip because she's missing Mexico and also because she's a total rock star. <laughs> At acupuncture last Wednesday, Janine said, You are in a time of your life when you need some serious mothering, but mothering in the largest sense. And I said, You mean like the ocean? And she said, Exactly. And that's why we're here. My conversations with Janine often go like that. It's not just that I don't know where the things she says come from. I don't know where what I say comes from either. Another time she said, by the way, there are a bunch of Native Americans hanging around your navel. They want you to think about origins. <laughs> Once the sky opens like a mouth and invites you inside it, everything starts to feel like a riddle. On the I-25 between Albuquerque and Santa Fe after midnight, the billboards read like runes. Psychic Mary, great at parties, comes first with her blue eyeshadow and a red turban and a psychotic twinkle in her eye that makes one fear what kind of party she'd be great at. <laughs> Next is the A alt deo sign, the burnt out letters turning a porn shop into a Latin prayer. <laughs> Finally, reads the next one, Holly Holmes versus Bobby Joe Sanders, June 13th at the Isleta Casino. Both women look tough for the camera in their boxing gloves and bunny garb. One time on the Big Island, I got to swim next to a giant sea turtle. And after I wore myself out trying to keep up with him, I sat on the sand and waited for that moment when your skin stops feeling sticky and starts feeling clean, and that voice that talks to me sometimes, not like schizophrenia, but really, how would I know, said, it's about time you learned how to pray. Back on Limitor, Rory is shaking off water like a dog, and I think of a different day on North Beach when a real dog walked up to us, some kind of dachshund, wearing a sign that covered almost all of his back that said, Hi, my name is Baker, and I am enjoying myself on the beach while my dad surfs. If you want, you can throw a rock for me, but please don't let me run in front of cars in the parking lot. <laughs> I remember the colors of Mackenzie's height, backlit against the gray sky, the shimmer on the water, the curling blue waves, the lighthouse flashing its single beam in the distance. Today on Limitor, I'm watching for spouts, thinking about how the size of a blue whale's tongue is the same size as the largest current land animal, the African elephant. How a blue whale's heart weighs a thousand pounds and is the size of a Volkswagen. How you could put a small child down its blowhole if you wanted to. How one scientist bet that he could walk through a dead blue whale's aorta, and then he did. Uh, this is just a little one. This is 67 Denver, Colorado. This morning at Ruby's house, the kids are playing Would You Rather. And Marla, whose weight is currently at the bottom of her 50-pound cycle and is therefore all cleavage and ponytails, says, Pam, would you rather look like you do now forever or get wise? Get wise, I say, no brainer. What if you could look like you looked when you were 25 forever? Same answer, I say, and Marla narrows her eyes. Rick always says, you are so beautiful on the inside, except when he says, you are so beautiful when I'm inside you, which Cinder tells me is even worse. <laughs> well, says Marla, what if you could have all the wisdom of a lifetime and still look like you looked when you were 25? Or what, I say. What, what, she says. <laughs> I say, I thought we were playing Would You Rather. <laughs> she twists her head like a dog at a foghorn. Marla, I say, you get the wisdom because you don't look any more like you did when you were 25. <laughs> she says, you don't understand the rules to this game. <laughs> 71, Milwaukee, Wisconsin.
Driving from Chicago in the minus six degree weather, neck craned out the window looking for the lunar eclipse because the rocket scientists told me to, but the light pollution extends all the way to the Wisconsin border and I think I'm probably facing the wrong direction anyhow. <laughs> if I became the rocket scientist's girlfriend, the fortune cookie about me being the reasonable one would never, ever, ever be true. <laughs> in Milwaukee, everything is frozen solid. The river, the stoplights, even my car door. But when I get to my high-rise hotel room, there is the eclipse right out my window, halfway over and looking strange enough to scare a caveman or an ancient Egyptian to death. Trish comes to meet me for breakfast with her sperm bank in vitro baby, and I have no idea how to respond as she details all the ways her life has become a living hell. She knows I thought she was crazy to do it at her age, alone with her 80 hour a week job, and now here she is, as if to prove me wrong, but everything she says makes her life sound about 10 times worse than I could have imagined. The lake is frozen as far out as you can see. Blocks of ice heaved up on the shore like wrecked cars, and Cliff Parker, whose law firm is sponsoring my visit, picks me up and takes me to the Milwaukee Country Club for lunch. It is so much like the country club in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, that my father could just barely afford to belong to. It takes my breath away. <laughs> Only, it is like it is still 1972 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The white wallpaper with little parasol-toting maid maidens doing tour jetés across it. The four dead gray-haired ladies propped up in the corner as if to look like they're playing bridge. <laughs> the place probably seats 250, not even counting the no women allowed grill downstairs. And yet, other than the dead ladies in the corner, we are the only ones eating today. The point of this luncheon, I quickly understand, is so that Cliff can show me why he is a lawyer and not a writer, to show me the kind of life he gave up writing for. He has invited eight people to the luncheon besides the two of us, and exactly none of them show up. I can't decide if Cliff Parker is a sociopath or just so completely normal that he is incomprehensible to me. Our waitress is named is actually named Trudy. She has a beehive hairdo and is at least 114 years old. <laughs> we both order the Cobb salad, and for some inexplicable reason, it takes 45 minutes to arrive. <laughs> the room is being heated to a sultry 85 degrees, and there is a squirrel hurling himself repeatedly at the floor-to-ceiling window behind Cliff's head. <laughs> over and over, he climbs the nearest tree and then flies, flying squirrel style, and lands splat with his face against the window where his paws achieve suction for a little more than one second before he slides like a cartoon character down to the bottom of the glass. He does this five or six times before I comment on it. Though it makes such a terrible noise every time he hits, I can't believe Cliff doesn't turn around. Probably rabid, Cliff says with a casual look at his hand. And I feel my eyebrows go up and he says, a lot of the squirrels around here are. 